It's Bigfoot Collectors Club with Bryce and Michael. I know a ghost story or two. Let's do this. <laughs> From the yeah. high <laughs> desert in the great American Southwest. <laughs> Wrong show. What? It's after midnight. I thought this was our chance to do coast to coast. No, no bro. No. Oh, man. <laughs> well, hey, everybody. Uh, thank you for joining us. Uh, welcome to a very special live episode of Bigfoot Collectors Club here on the phenomena con live stream brought yeah. to you by the good weirdos at the traveling museum of the paranormal and occult uh i'm your host michael mcmillan with me always is your other host bryce johnson and our super producer riley bray uh hey for those of you who are at the con and winding down and wondering who the hell we are and just listening to us for the first time uh bcc is a weekly comedy paranormal podcast about the unexplained where we interview amazing guests about their personal paranormal history and share stories of high strangeness that's uh, right that's right i'm michael uh i'm an actor you may have seen me in shows like true blood or crazy ex-girlfriend or perry mason bryce is actually yeah. i mean look we're enthusiasts about the paranormal we're not uh experts necessarily we're kind of like we're kind of like you guys who just love to think and talk about this stuff but that being said bryce i mean you have a little bit more experience in in this field than i do hey no more than you man i mean i started out as an armchair but yes i also am an actor and uh and a producer and you may recognize me from shows like uh film like willow creek and tv shows like pretty little liars and also travel channels uh expedition bigfoot so uh, I'm so excited to be here tonight, man. Uh, this is a thrill for me. You've actually been on a Bigfoot hunt. Where yeah, I'm an Riley expert I, now. Yeah, we're just, <laughs> you're an expert. We're, <laughs> we're, we're posers. Uh, <laughs> Riley, why don't you tell the good people who you are? Hey, everybody. I'm Riley. Um, I'm a musician and a producer. I play in a band called Spindrift. Um, I'm also a video director. I work for Gibson and making their content on Gibson TV. Uh, and I work with these two guys. Uh, producing this show and it's a it's a labor of love and uh, we've all become best buds over making this show the, yep. the, the rule the rule is uh come for michael and bryce stay for riley <laughs> i'd like to think so yeah. he's our secret weapon uh so tonight to wind down day one of phenomena con we are sitting down with the two if not just two maybe the two uh creators of the conference for a special club bigfoot after party midnight chat yeah they are ooh, that's the club nice. Bigfoot sound. i'll yeah. drink to that <laughs> yeah. they are sure. a yeah sure. exactly if you got a martini <laughs> break it out guys we're coming down this is gonna be kind of a chill hang tonight yeah. i sound like a real dad with no kids <laughs> this is my special non-alcoholic beer uh cool dad's club yeah cool dad's club, cool dad's club. <laughs> uh our guest tonight I mean, come on. They are paranormal investigators. They're co-founders of the Traveling Museum of the Paranormal and Occult. They're co-producers of Planet Weird, the production company that, that brought you the documentary series that reinvented mm. paranormal investigation shows, Hellier, uh, of which they both starred in. We are huge fan of theirs, Bryce Riley. I mean, we've talked about Hellier and specifically these two people on the show multiple times. Mm -hmm. For sure. In they've, depth. they've never been guests. I'm so excited that we are finally able to sit down and talk to them, pick their brains at a very vulnerable moment in their lives, which is <laughs> at the very end of a long, productive day for them. We got them right where we want them. Yeah, we're going to get it all <laughs> out now. down. <laughs> they can't hide anything from us. Uh, but we finally get to talk to them about our favorite topic, high strangeness. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, please give a warm Club Bigfoot salute to Greg and Dana Newkirk. Yeah! What's up, oh dudes? Oh, my God. Yeah. Yeah. Look at these guys. We're wow. finally making it happen. It's wow. happening. I am so... You know what? It almost works out better that this is how this happens. Because <laughs> I know that we've been trying to do this for a long time, but yeah. we're like the worst. <laughs> no. By the worst, Us you mean too. the best. I'll take yeah. it. 
Yeah. Um, first of all, I hope you guys have. Uh, if you if you drink, I hope you have a martini. If you don't, I hope you got a soda water. You guys, soda water. Hey, good. cheers! You guys mm-hmm. uh, nailed cheers. it today. I, I mm-hmm. gotta say, uh, Bryce and I both. Riley was working all day today. Bryce, Bryce and I are the only people who don't actually work right now. So <laughs> 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 we got to watch uh, the sh- the conference today, a good right. chunk of it, and it was fantastic. I'm gonna steal your guest list for the for the show. Do it. Do it. That's the whole point. Yeah. We want mm. these are all the people. It's a very highly curated list of people that are are important to us and much smarter than we are. Yeah, and inform all of our thoughts and ideas. It's very true. And uh, you know, we they're people we love, but that's also why we wanted you guys to do this with us. Oh, thank you so much. Oh. How are you guys feeling? Are you good? You feel good about? Are you ready to kick back, have a drink, go to bed? Dude, I've been up till six o'clock in the morning for the last three days, so I'm roaring, rip roaring, ready to go. I don't really know. I don't really know what's gonna come out of our mouths. I it could, oh. it could be good, it could be bad. We'll take We're just it gonna way. go go on this journey together, I guess. Is what's it's, about to happen. It's the lucid hour. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, for people who listen to our podcast, know that we like to ask all of our guests, and for you in particular, the two of you, this is a an extremely loaded question. <laughs> What is your personal paranormal history? Oh, God. Yeah. Oh, it, ours is, is, you can answer that however you want. If, it, if there's like one starting incident or your favorite incident, we know that you guys have probably a few you're thinking of. I mean, my I can I can start. Yeah. My my history is is honestly very boring. Uh, I didn't experience anything weird. I mean, everybody, it seems like the, the more that you dig into this, everybody has like their story, right? Mm. The story that the started them, the, story. the ghost that they saw when they were a kid. I never had any of that. Um, I had to go looking for monsters and I typically did not find them very much. Mm. It was mostly just me and my friends, uh, falling through the floorboards and abandoned buildings as kids. Uh, <laughs> And then eventually, I, from what I've heard about your backstory, there was a lot of like teenage shenanigans and possibly loaded weapons in your backstory. <laughs> Lots of loaded Dude, weapons. Dude, my my friends and I used to steal our parents' credit cards and order like crossbows and medieval weapons off of eBay. I've seen this photographic evidence because the way that we started was we were really just sort of like vampire hunter LARPing. We weren't really taking anything <laughs> seriously. And then there was the, the day that like some weird stuff started to get thrown at us in a cemetery, but that was like a year into our origin story. And the that's day really you how it started. Fire your crossbow. <laughs> <laughs> that day cro- you forgot your crossbow. <laughs> no, I almost. I here's the problem. That crossbow was always fired at each other. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's the problem. problem. One we of used you to in died in, for in sure. but see here's the thing though because we were vampire hunting. We would go to um, we would go to shop class and we would be secretly carving stakes, and we'd make long ones that would go into the crossbow. Oh my god! <laughs> the problem is when you fired it, they always like did this like flip when they come out because they weren't made to do that. Uh, and then I almost watched my friend Nick get impaled by it. Jason shot one directly at him. So there you go. That's mine. You're like trying to like smolt your like uh, silver amulet. You're like, yeah. I just need a. A special he, tip for this one, Mr. Hayward. <laughs> I'll, he, I'll found, he found the secret forge in his high school that right. he didn't know was there. He's like, no, it was, forge here. it was the uh, the shop teacher who had like three fingers <laughs> yeah. is who our, our forge was. <laughs> the only thing we ever did in shop was like build like boxcar, like derbies, cars. And then like our shop teacher would put on home improvement. <laughs> Every Friday, we would just watch oh, Home man. Improvement. He was Amazing. like done. He was That's done so for the funny. week. And That's what we were supposed to be doing. Yeah, was making cars and watching yeah. Home Improvement. But my friends and I were we had monster bad kids. hunting weapons. My story is a little bit less violent and teen angsty, I guess. Uh, my friends and I really we were just interested in weird things and. Uh, I mean, originally, we really didn't realize that you could go out and even look for stuff like this. And it wasn't until I actually found Greg's uh, website when we were way back in the GeoCities days in 2001. And uh, yeah, we just started going out and investigating. And it was kind of the same sort of thing. It was that moment where when something really weird happens when you're out there and you kind of have to sort of come to terms with the fact that 
it's real. And you just, everyone's like, this is, wait, this is actually real. Ghosts are real. So there was a lot of that in the early days and just out kind of exploring uh, weird haunted places in Kitchener, Waterloo, which is where I'm originally from. Waterloo, say, say that again. I'm sorry. Kitchener, Waterloo, Ontario. Oh, wow. Ontario. Yes. Yeah, so I'm Canadian. What, what, uh, on uh, like Canadian folklore, Ooh. do we not get down here that you're like, oh man, if they only knew about this cryptid, they'd be super stoked. I wish that we we had like a re like just Canadian only cryptid, but I feel like. <laughs> What was the one Tyler was talking about the other day? He sent you a screenshot from it Cabbage was, Town, and you're like, "I've lived there my whole. I lived there for years, and I never cabbage, heard of that." The Cabbage Patch Kid. <laughs> it was. It was just the basic time. Like it looked like a little Mothman, but a goblin. But he lived in. He lives in the sewer Cute. in Toronto, apparently. So oh, that's fun. He's just a little guy. Just a <laughs> little, little sewer Mothman. Moth. A little. Yeah, our Canadian Mothmen apparently are smaller and don't have wings. I. Ooh. <laughs> Does, isn't that what qualifies you to be a Mothman? Is more, like an, more like an true. ant Maybe man he'd be then. like a lizard man. More a lizard like a man? Lizard. He has the beady red eyes, though. So that's mm. what makes me think of Mothman. Right, yeah, right. I can't think of like a Canadian only. The only thing that comes to mind, and I'm just, this is a stupid <laughs> joke, but like I'm thinking of uh, Trailer Park Boys and, and like Bubbles saying Sam Squanch. <laughs> so maybe we have a Sam Squanch. It's a classic. It should be common official. Like it should. Cryptid. We need it. We need to put them on our money. I think. <laughs> Make it official. <laughs> so how did this happen? How did you two get together? Totally. <laughs> we hated each we other. We did. We, we were really. Oh yeah. We had rival ghost hunting teams back in oh, uh, two thousand. They weren't it. rival. They didn't start as rival. We were more we, like a brother I, sister group. We need you to unpack all the of this. Mm -hmm. <laughs> all right. All right. Yeah. So my team in Canada, we were all uh, female. So we're, we were an all girls team and uh, we met the crossbow kids and we kind of <laughs> <laughs> started up, a, a, you know, like a fun uh, online kind of friendship. And we, at the time, I think we were probably on the same level as far as investigating the paranormal ghosts. So <laughs> we were learning from each other, which is terrifying. <laughs> <laughs> but uh what initially started off as like a fun uh you know brother sister team unsurprisingly ended in here's what happened there we go <laughs> yeah, here's, here's what happened break it down but break it on you down. might say there were there were two key elements that happened that caused us to become mortal enemies yes the first was this tells you what kind of boys we were because we were an all dude team we I don't know if you we caught this, but we're kind of nerds and uh, didn't really, <laughs> weren't really great with, with girls. So <laughs> they said, hey, we're going to plan a trip and we want to come down and spend a weekend with you guys. And instead of us doing what normal teenage boys would do when a bunch of pretty girls want to come down and spend the weekend with them, <laughs> all of our grandparents died at the same time. It was very suspicious. <laughs> We were all like, we were like, we're not, they're not staying with no, me. Was no, there, girls we, allowed. Was no, like, like an so early <laughs> unintentional occult ritual. It sounds like <laughs> kind of. It was terrible. We were very worried about some sort of grandfather's only murderer that lived in the year down. Oh, yeah. Something <laughs> weird is happening where Greg lives. <laughs> yes, and it's only going after grandparents. <laughs> <laughs> that was the start, and that that uh, they were miffed about that, which yes. I don't blame them. Um, and then, then the real kicker was they got a television show. Yeah. They got a television show out of the deal. They were the, <laughs> they were like really the first Canadian ghost hunting show. Yeah. I mean, that's it came out wild. like the same time as ghost hunters. It was yeah, crazy. That's uh, why I always make the joke that we, uh, our, our show was called the girly ghost hunters and we traveled all Greg's. What is that's it? Greg's alarm for tomorrow morning. What a professional <laughs> over here. He, hey dude, day two's starting. You got to get up. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Oh, oh my god. But yeah, so my friends and I had uh, a TV show called Girly Ghost Hunters and it uh we investigated the paranormal all across Ontario and we came our show came out the same year that Ghost Hunters did and we were I think we aired 6 months before Ghost Hunters and my I, the joke I always make is that we got one season and they got 10. But we got wow. six, 6 months right. earlier though so I can brag about that I guess. Started we were, we were a bunch of butt hurt dudes and about it and so hurt. uh what were the what was the last thing we I'll never forget. I it's etched into my mind. Yeah. I was at home and Dana sent me an instant message. What was it on? 
it was it had on to have like, been like Yahoo Instant Yahoo Messenger. Yahoo Instant Messenger. And she was like, "It was 2001 when this happened. What's wrong with you guys? Why are you being such? They dicks? were being really mean to us. <laughs> and on I had one of my website. friends over and, my shoulder. Yeah. And then the last thing that Greg said to me was that I was a hairy slut. <laughs> Greg. No. Yeah. yeah. Those are the last I mean, words we spoke for like that was years. It for years. years. Oh wow. then, boy, yeah. oh boy. Now I'm getting a full painted picture of why this didn't work out at first. <laughs> mm -hmm. I mean, um, he must have really liked you. It sounds like to me. I think I mean, you the, know. I did. It was a forbidden love. <laughs> yeah. Dana's yeah, Dana it. was uh, when you're like in your when you're a teenager, when you're 16 and someone's a few years older than you, it's a bigger deal. Yeah. yeah for I mean, sure. like a prison deal. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. It couldn't happen. Plus, she was dating the captain of the football team. Right. And so it just wasn't it wasn't. And you were a be. nerd making crossbows, crossbows in shop. Yeah. 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 But then seven years later it was seven something, something like, like seven years later, Greg was moving and he decided to go on a kind of pilgrimage of apology. And without contacting any of us, he and his friend printed off pictures of us and drove to our town and literally just started asking around. Aww. <laughs> and found us in like, what, 40 minutes? 45 minutes we had our first lead. <laughs> yeah. And then we went on a ghost hunt that night. Uh -huh. all, that this, this is just support that all Canadian murders ha are solved <laughs> within 45 minutes. <laughs> Print out pictures, <laughs> walk around town. That's all you have to do. Pretty <laughs> sub. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. She lives right over there. She's been dating the captain of the football <laughs> team, you know. Yep. That was pretty much how it went, too. Yeah. And it's also alarming that, like, Canadians will also just tell you where each other lives without any <laughs> concern about your, your safety or well-being or anything like that. So, yeah, so deal. Dana, you are not just a, uh, a, a paranormal investigator. You are also a magic practitioner. And, and are you a Wiccan? Am I getting that? That's not right, is it? What? A it, I mean, so I've been practicing magic for uh, over 20 years now. And I think I'm... I'm the first person to say that I had a Wiccan phase. It was it okay. was pretty much during the beginning, but now uh, a days I kind of just refer to myself as a hedge witch, and it's just sort of a term for me yes. that kind of I you know it basically means I practice solitary, so I'm not in a coven and I don't really work magic with other people. And usually the magic that I practice tends to be pretty nature based, so mm. I focus a lot on working with nature and the cycles of nature. The hedge I mean, witch. That's such a cool <laughs> phrase. I remember you saying that in hell. So forgive me. Yeah, it makes no me think about the hedge knights, you know, who used to be knights that were just like, hey, I'm a knight for hire. I'll help you out if you got a problem, but I'm not like sworn to any kingdom. That's kind of cool. Yeah. I mean, hedge witches really like if you uh, one of the best ways to think about them is they were usually sometimes they were referred to as cunning folk, uh, but they were people who practiced magic or they practiced folk magic or uh, and they worked with herbs and they usually were the people who lived along the hedgerow so mm. they lived further away from the the town itself but not quite completely separated from the town so if you needed something you would have to go right to the edge where the wilds mm. and the forests were and that was the spaces that the hedge witches would live and kind of you'd have to go out into to the dangerous spaces just a little bit uh but you weren't quite out into the wilds so what are the benefits of like, you know, going kind of lone wolf as opposed to like working in a coven? I bet you there's a lot of advantages. Sure. I it's I think for a lot of people initially when they start practicing magic, it's nice to have people around you that you can bounce ideas off of and you can learn from. But the older I get and the more that I do practice solitary, really, it does become a very personalized mm. spiritual practice then. And so I might have a way of doing something that's very different than another person, and maybe they would be uncomfortable with that uh, you know, in circle. So it's, it's kind of a nice thing because it's a very kind of fine-tuned and tailored uh, spiritual practice that really, for the most part, it has happened that way just because I've been practicing solitary for so long. Incredible. So, Greg, you said that you never had a uh, anything really happen to you, but obviously you guys were interested in this beyond vampire LARPing. Like, you know, I think uh, Riley and I had weird experiences as a kid. Bryce had a weird experience as a kid, but I think sort of the common ground that we discover is like, hey, turns out your public school library has some really cool books. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. True. I want to know if that was potentially a gateway for you into like how you got into this subject. A thousand percent. <laughs> a hundred thousand percent. Yeah. Uh, it was really, you know what it was, was 
we were vampire LARPing. We, it all started because we wanted to scare our friend in a cemetery. And then when weird stuff happened, uh, like we had our older brothers and older friends hanging out there. And it was like Blair Witch signs hanging from the trees and stuff like that. But when weird stuff happened, we had such a good time. We went out again. And then like occasionally like somebody would feel a tap on their arm or we'd get something thrown at us. That's when we would hit the library and we would start reading books by like Ed and Lorraine Warren and Hans Holzer and realizing, oh, ghosts are real. Like monsters are real. We mm-hmm. need to go and, and take this a little more seriously. I mean, how seriously can you take it when you're 14? Yeah. But you at least are interested. Mm-hmm. And so that was like pro- X-Files was on TV. Um, I mean, 14 when I really got into acting. So like it can't, it's a very influential <laughs> age. <laughs> and look, it it's ruined all of our lives. I know. <laughs> One thing I love about this, uh, it, yeah, exactly. One thing I love about uh, the, sort of this paranormal thing, and, and I think you guys can uh, speak to this too, is that literature plays such an important part. I mean, all of your fans and your museum members, they seem like such big readers. And why do you think that is? Why do you think people who are interested in this stuff are constantly having to search out different authors? And why are books so important in this field? I think, I mean, it's a, it's, it's a hunger for knowledge. Mm-hmm. Mm. It's, you know, the unexplained. Somebody wants it explained to them. And we always joke about how Hellier is a show about reading books. Because <laughs> it really is. Mm-hmm. It's just book recommendations here and here and here and here. And that's why, that's the thing that I love about this subject matter is there's no shortage of things to read. There's no yeah. shortage of new ideas. And... Uh, I mean, take your pick, uh, take your pick. And there's, there's plenty to, there's plenty to pull from. And the more that you read, especially the more you read stuff that's varied, the more you yeah. can kind of put together your own picture of maybe what's going on. And I think that's why people, <clears throat> I, I hope they like to read and we're always trying to get people to. I think it's, it's a nice thing. I mean, at the end of the day, it really gives people the confidence to start coming up with their own theories about things. And I think that paranormal TV is great and it really does bring people to the subject matter in really big ways. You can bring a huge audience of people in to, to kind of take in the content. But once you start really going out and reading, uh, you know, authors that you like or reading about subjects that you like, you can start to form your own theories and it really breaks you out of that kind of box that can you can find yourself in if you're just consuming kind of paranormal uh, television. It's it's nice to have a balance of both because then you're, you're allowed to kind of bring creativity into it and you don't feel like, oh, I have to use this tool or I have to do things this way. It really gives you that confidence to just go for it and really start coming up with your own ideas. It's a lot like music, isn't it, Riley? Don't you? Does That's kind of what it reminds me of, like, getting into, like, oh, I got into this band and then this opened the door to this band or, you know. Yeah. Definitely. I mean, it's a, it, everybody hits their Pandora's box, you know, and I, for me, I think music and the paranormal overlap. I mean, like for like getting into like Led Zeppelin and the Rolling totally. Stones yeah. and their love of the occult and, and all these things. And that's actually what opened a lot of doors for me into the paranormal. Um, so that was, you know, that's, there is a lot of overlap there. And it is, it's just a, it's a thirst for knowledge. It's a thirst to engage with something larger than yourself you know and and you can do that in in, through witchcraft or through music or through making a ridiculous podcast i think that's the thing that really appeals to me about this and i still shy away from it honestly like in a very big way that i think if you know as we're heading into the beginning of the fourth year of this podcast like i'm gonna have to like confront at some point but there's there's that interactive nature to to the to this like the thing that i love about like the occult and just the phenomenon in general and these books is it does sort of ask you to participate in it which i feel like you guys obviously are doing in the work that you do that bryce and riley and i are inspired by when we read books like you know the Mothman pri- prophecies, you know, just that that sort of there's that romantic idea of like boots to the ground investigation, getting there and, and go, going out and searching. And it's it's been really fun to watch Bryce manifest that with mm-hmm. um, Expedition Bigfoot. I mean, I have to feel like maybe I, I don't know not to make this about us, <laughs> but please, like, please, but but <laughs> we would never. <laughs> it is it is so weird to me. Still, and I'm I'm interested on your take, and maybe people can uh, listening at home might apply this to things in their projects in their own life. That like, 
you know, within a year and a half of us beginning this podcast called Bigfoot Collectors Club, Bryce is suddenly plucked and put into a show where he's literally being sent out to look for the cryptid. That's amazing. Well, there seems to be a, 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 you seem to have an easier way of manifestation when you have these tools at your hand. I mean, there's something about it. it. You know, we always talk about when you engage with this phenomenon, it seems to engage back with you. And I love how you guys say, you know, how important it is to come up with your own hypotheses and, and, and theories. And I think that this phenomenon begs that of the, uh, of the participant. It says, what have you got? You know, figure me out. You know, mm -hmm. you seem to be a great mind for this, you know, come play with us, you know? And, yeah. uh, but yeah, I, I, uh, I don't know what I, my question is, Michael, but yeah, uh, there's well, something about that. You know, I'm interested on Greg and Dana's thoughts, like how it all sorts of without this podcast, I don't know if we would have found you guys and mm -mm. other people that are in this, it all seems to build on one another. Have, do you guys, I have, I have a couple thoughts and I think the first one is mm -hmm. The paranormal is a subjective experience. Mm -hmm. It's something that, you know, you can have two people standing right next to each other and they can experience a very different event, a, a very different interpretation of an event. But I think, and that, that causes a problem for studying it and, and trying to figure it out and solving it, um, which I don't think we'll ever do. But I don't think that's the point. I think the point is to experience the paranormal, which is a subjective thing. You have to subject yourself to it. It's why a lot of hardcore skeptics who refuse to even leave uh, the possibility of something like that, they don't experience anything because mm -hmm. they won't mm -hmm. actually give themselves <laughs> over to it. And I really do think the longer we do this, the more the paranormal in all its forms, whatever you want to call it, the phenomena, the phenomenon, whatever, it needs us to invest in it for it to manifest. It mm -hmm. has to have some give and take for you to experience it. And if you refuse to give, you're not going to get anything in return, which I think is a double-edged sword because we all know people who go a little too over the deep end. You know, we we see it with Hellier. Does this weird thing to people and there's some people who just take it a little too far and they just go, they're just nuts. Uh. Um, <laughs> we're on the verge of doing that a lot of the time. <clears throat> And so it's uh you know it's a it's a bit of a game of of tug of war, uh, trying to figure out where that middle ground is, so that you can get that engagement back by giving a little bit. I think uh, the way that I always look at it, and it's not even really looking at the way that I feel about it, and is this idea that what we're experiencing is uh, it's really a current. It's a current that's pulling us through, and I think that that current really. Uh, works because of resonance. So when we become in line with it, we become part of the current and we get pulled into it. Mm. And it's as if that process activates us. And then because we're in resonance with it, we start to draw more of it towards us because it's like attracts like. It wants to be with you. So that sense of kind of give and take, that sense of play, I think play is the most important part. It's really playing with it. Like you said, you know, engaging with it. And recognizing that there is sort of a dance happening. There's a bit of a, a give and take, but it's all because we're in that current of resonance with with it. And and so people who do tend to be really skeptical, it's it's as if they can't get into the current, they can't align with it because they're just not in the same kind of resonance. And so I like thinking of it in, in that way. And it feels right, uh, at least as far as hell your ghost to sort of think about it in that way, that it's really just this this beautiful current that you're kind of just being pulled into. Yeah. I like that well, idea. Of, beautiful, yeah. Of, yeah. Beautifully said. And that mm -hmm. idea of play makes so much sense to mm -hmm. Bryce and I as actors and Riley as a musician that yeah. we know that there's a moment when you're in the flow yeah. that you're engaging with, even with another physical person on stage, there's, there seems to be another sort of intelligence coming through behind that in art as well. Mm -hmm. So I, I really dig that. Um, to wrap up the per paranormal, uh, personal paranormal history stuff, can you guys pinpoint for each of you the moment when you felt like you knocked and it knocked back? Is there a moment when you went, oh, I mean, Greg, you were sort of alluding to it about the, the night in the graveyard when something happened. What was the moment that made the lights go on for you when you were like, okay, something's going on? I mean, for me, <clears throat> I think that was the first point was the uh, 
the, the night in Barkley Cemetery, Barkley Mountain Cemetery. Um, we had driven out there. Uh, it's a tiny little cemetery in, in the middle of nowhere on top of a mountain. It's the only thing that's left of an old ghost town, mining town, um, miles from civilization. And this was like right after we had gone and started uh, LARPing. And we had gone there without anyone hiding, without anyone scaring us. And we started to get, like, there was maybe six or seven of us, and we were getting hit with these, like, like something was poking us, jabbing us, like something was throwing stuff at us. And then we find out that it was little bits of coal. There were little mm. tiny pieces of coal, and it was an old mining cemetery. And I still have, actually, I, th- I think it's up right there. I still have that piece of coal. That Whoa. one thing that, like, really set everything in motion for me. Um, I picked it up and I, I, I said, I'm, I'm taking this home. And then that was it. When I was like, something is, is speaking to us from somewhere else. I, I thought it was ghosts, you know, dead people then, but my opinions have changed a lot. But that I think was the moment for me. Maybe it's Indrid Cole. <laughs> <Could I be? laughs> a little healthier Maybe. humor. Maybe. Maybe. It was Maybe. Early it's all connected, man. It's all connected. <laughs> that, Trace that it back. That joke is for this audience and this audience. Only. <laughs> yeah. He knows he, he knows how to read a room, you know. Yeah. <laughs> um, I think that for me, probably, I, I definitely had many experiences leading up to this experience, but this was the one that I think was undeniable, and it it was something for me. It was undeniable because it happened very early in uh, my time investigating the paranormal. And it also happened in front of a really big group of people, which at the time for me was very important, I think, uh, you know, to sort of be willing to believe that this kind of stuff was happening. And it happened when we were uh, filming the last episode of Girly Ghost Hunters, which was at a location in um, Ontario, in Castro, Ontario, called The Hermitage. And it's an old abandoned uh, ma- uh, mansion that had burned down a few times. And there were lots of stories. We were investigating this location and there's lots of kind of local legends and ghost stories about the woman who lived there having had experiences, uh, you you know, coming back and scaring people off the property. And it's a very kind of isolated place. You have to walk a mile through the woods just to get to the ruins. So it was a perfect place for TV ghost hunt. Mm -hmm. And uh, we weren't really expecting anything too scary to happen. We had been there a few times and, and not really had that much activity. And this specific night, um, there had been a story that we had heard, and it's kind of a trope at this point, but usually when people, it normally happens when people haven't done any research. (laughs) And usually you'll you'll hear, it was a Native American burial ground, or it was just something that kind of gets clumped into that category. And so at that point, you know, we had heard that a few times from people, and we didn't really believe, believe it. Um, so it was a, a crew of maybe 15 people and halfway through the investigation, I'm looking uh, about 30 feet away from me and in the woods that are about 30 feet away from me. And again, we're miles in the middle of nowhere. This seven, seven, seven and a half feet tall static creature, creature or shape. It was like the outline of something with very long arms. And the way I describe it is it looked like an outline encased with like television static. And it, it literally walked out of the woods. So the, the, it was dark and the static movement kind of comes out of the woods. And as I'm looking at it and trying to ha- like focus my eyes on it, I can see the definition of the arms. I can see that it has legs and that it's moving towards us. And then I see two more of them come out of the woods on either side. And these ones are a little bit smaller. And at this point, I'm realizing that all of the rest of the crew are all staring at the same thing. Like we're all literally looking at it. So there at this point where we were, there were seven or eight people watching this thing. I don't know what it was. It, they seemed to come out of the, out of the woods and instantly felt as if they're, they did not want us there because they, their body shape, like the way they were moving their body, it was as if they were trying to herd us off the property. Hmm. And they were all these like, again, it was like static from a TV very dark static from a television encased in this bizarre humanoidish shape. And they came out. We obviously lost our crap. Uh, The crew were freaking out. Like everyone was freaking out. And it was this moment of just kind of pure chaos where everyone, like our paradigms were shifting. We couldn't understand what was happening. And then just as quickly as they 
came out of the woods, they went right back into the woods, and then we literally packed up all of our stuff and left. <laughs> but that for me, Weird. I mean, happening in front of that many people and it being to this day still the most visual thing that I've really probably ever seen. And it was Greg, pretty incredible. Greg just had a couple Greg pieces had of some... charcoal thrown at him. <laughs> so, sorry, dude. Like I said, <laughs> not that interesting. <laughs> She that wins again. For the win. <laughs> that is wild. And I'm sure you guys know, because we've gotten letters from, we do L Files episodes here on the show, Bigfoot Collectors Club at gmail.com. If you got a story like Dana's or Greg's, send it to us. Um, but we hear these stories of static. They're almost like shadow creatures, but they're yeah. these static men or static creatures that show up sometimes in people's bedrooms. What the fuck is that, Dana? What what, I, what do you think that is? The only thing that I've ever really been able to kind of come to any conclusion on was a sense that there it had to have been some kind of an elemental or something that was land based. I think protecting the land mm. because it it had a very animal mm. kind of energy to it. Like it, yeah. I remember very distinctly it was hunched over and it was kind of like stalking us and it was it had its sights on us and it knew that it didn't want us on the property and the other two seemed to be just sort of flanking it like helping to guide us off the property but it was this sense of it did not want us there we were doing something that i don't think it wanted us to be doing so and it felt very land-based and kind of very it felt like it was non-human, like it had never been human. There was something very kind of primordial about it almost. Yeah, did did everyone wild. did everyone that see it see the same version of it? Like did everyone see the same thing or did it present differently to the different it, viewers? It looked as far as everyone's descriptions uh, kind of in the moment because it was being obviously it's it's the final episode of girly ghost hunters and and oh, in the moment we're all kind of saying the same thing like we're, do you do you see the shadow thing do you and the craziest part about it and it's so frustrating is the cameraman had it on camera he could see it in his viewfinder but when they played the tape back there was nothing there but he could Ugh. see it like he could actually see it and uh but we were That's all kind it. of describing the same thing because the the way that it was moving and the way that it was kind of coming towards us, I mean, we were all reacting to it. So everyone was, again, it was kind of like a moment of pure chaos where everyone just couldn't figure out what was happening at that point. Cause we were sort of really taken off guard thinking it was going to be a chill night. <laughs> and like the shadow monster people decided that it wasn't going to be nah, chill at all. Nah. <laughs> I don't like it. I don't like it. Also, you can blame that static man for why you only had one season. Oh, if exactly. he had showed up yeah. on camera, yeah. he should have showed up yeah. at the beginning of the season, not the <laughs> end of the season. Fuck shadow man. Come on. <laughs> don't say that. He's going to show up in our bedroom later. God. He'll be like, ah, that's my revenge. Oh, All right. Man. Well, we're going to get into more of your paranormal investigations that you guys have done, but it's time for a game that we all like to play <laughs> with all of our guests. Uh, I'm going to go down a list of phenomenon. Oh. And rapid fire style. And if you're open to it, you're going to say, believe it. If you're not, you're going to say, bullshit. This is a game that we like to call bullshit <laughs> or believe it. I love the sound effects. <laughs> Greg and Dana that. Newkirk, are you ready? I'm yes. ready. Let's do it. On your mark. Oh, God. Get set. Ghosts. Believe, Believe it. it. UFOs. Believe, Believe it. it. Bigfoot. Believe, Believe it. it. Alien greys. Believe it. Believe it. <laughs> Great. Right. Well, I have half, half of them. Can I be like in the middle? <laughs> Dana, right. you are instinctively playing this game correctly. I love it. Yes. Out of body experiences. Believe, Believe it. it. Demonic possession. Poorly defined. But good good answer. Um, um believe it, but poorly defined. You only have two choices, Greg. Bullshit. No! <laughs> uh, bullshit. 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 Right there. Bullshit. Right. Bullshit. There you go. The Bermuda Triangle. Oh. As much as I want to, it's bullshit. I want to say bullshit. Alien abductions. Believe it. Believe it. Loch Ness Monster. Oh, believe it. I want I want it to be real, but I'm gonna say bullshit. Time travel. We talking physical? Yo. Whatever Bel it's you, baby. Believe it. Be I'm going to say believe it. I'm going to say yeah, believe yeah. it. All right, believe it. Reincarnation. Believe it. 
ESP. Oh, shit. Sorry. Tell my friend Grace Mitchell to keep it down because we're playing bullshit or believe it. It's a serious annoyed. business. <laughs> she's a friend of the friend Unless of the show. Unless she wants to jump on the house. game, <laughs> she's got to get out. All but right, here we go. Calls to take, all right? Uh, sorry, I'm going to go reincarnation again. Reincarnation. Believe it. Bullshit. <laughs> ESP. Believe, believe it. it. Haunted houses. Believe it. Believe it. The Illuminati. Bullshit. Uh, bullshit! 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 <laughs> <laughs> There's a face on Mars. Bullshit! bullshit. Skunk ape. Uh, believe it. Believe it. <laughs> sea serpents. Believe it. B- bullshit. Poltergeists. Believe, believe it. it. Chupacabra. Bullshit. bullshit. <laughs> Atlantis. Believe it. Bullshit. Will you believe that? I want to believe it. I want to believe it. (laughs) An alien spacecraft crashed at Roswell or Corona. Bullshit. Bullshit. Ooh, we might have to circle back. Heaven. (laughs) Uh, Bullshit. Believe it. Bullshit. Like the are we talking like per, like gates of that kind of thing? Whatever it means to you. Heaven's believe so tacky, it. dude. Believe it. No way. Bullshit. <laughs> Pearly <a> gates. <laughs> that of course leads me to the next one, which is hell. Bullshit. Bullshit. <laughs> nice. Nice. Life no on other planets. <laughs> believe it. Believe it. Parallel dimensions. Believe, believe it. it. The apocalypse. Ooh, Bullshit. I don't want to believe it, but kind of bullshit life after death believe, believe it. it goblins believe it you better believe it oh he's gonna say bullshit no he's not believe it uh, <laughs> it's right. gonna be difficult wow the new kirk survived bullshit or believe it i have to Amazing. say that was fascinating to informative me. yeah yeah um <laughs> All right, let's go. A couple notes here. Uh, I like the points of contention. One of them was Atlantis. Mm. Want to unpack that? I I love the idea of lost civilizations. I just sure. love the idea. You know, I I love every time we go to Mount Shasta. I'm like Lemuria. It's in there. Like I love the idea of lost civilizations. So there's part of me that just really wants to believe that. What really wants to just believe it. Yeah, yeah I just I just think it's tacky. <laughs> I'm just not into it. I think it's just too cheesy for me. I get it. I get that. A lot of the the new age. Yeah, there's a lot of new agey stuff. Yeah, a lot of that can feel a little cheesy to me. Although, you know, if I were confronted with it in real life, I'd probably be like, this feels great. I got to be honest. (laughs) Uh, And then just uh, just don't try to buy Lemurian crystals at contact in the desert. You you may get ripped off. You may get shunned. No. (laughs) We tried to interview him. He he would not do it. He had a (laughs) Oh, to hear with that a, technology man in a great hat. <laughs> You're not ready for this. <laughs> oh. Uh I'm curious what you guys think poltergeists are. I think we probably are on the same page. I mean, really one of the most fascinating things I think about a lot of poltergeist cases is really is looking into children that are in the home, but usually it's happening around kids going through puberty. And that seems to be a really big caveat to that. Those huge bursts of kind of psychokinetic energy Mm. that seems to happen around poltergeists. You know, like we, I think the most probably famous poltergeist case would be like the Enfield Mm. poltergeist and uh, the Enfield poltergeist case happened to, a huge, you know, family of teenage girls. And a lot of the activity was happening while they were going through puberty. So it seems to be, at least I think, uh, a huge uh, factor in that massive burst of poltergeist and, and psychokinetic energy. I think that stuff is all, you know, that, that idea of, of liminality and marginality. And yeah, I think point. that, um, you know, it's not just... I think we give it the name poltergeist, but I think it's a lot of different stuff. I think it's, you know, uh, phantom Bigfoots and and uh, alien abduction phenomena and things like that typically happen to people in a uh, middle state, in a yeah. place in between. Houses that are uh, half built or under construction, um, trailer parks, and, you know, the, the definition of a liminal space to live. It's a house that's on wheels. Like all these bridges, borders, bodies of water, all all mm-hmm. kinds of places like that. So I think that you know when it comes to poltergeists, you see poltergeists happen in in families uh, that are in turmoil or yeah. in a stage of transition. 
Um, you know, maybe somebody just died or kids going through puberty. Yeah. Um, I mean, puberty itself is like a liminal state. Absolutely. You're not an adult and you're not a child. So you're in that weird space in the in-between. Absolutely. So I think that poltergeist activity is just a, an offshoot of that weird state of existence. You know, one of the things that I think about, too, when you bring up um, Poltergeist is the Bell Witch, which mm. also I thought of when you were talking about ancient elementals, because the Bell Witch is one of those crossovers where it feels like that was a household with, you know, a lot of teenagers. And uh, it was also on like old land that um the the you know i, I forget the pa the patriarchal name of the family but that they probably you know there's that old cave that's i always feel like the bell witch was there for a long time mm. so i'm not sure which is which but there 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 is some sort of crossover there maybe well you got a cave which is a yeah. it's a liminal space it's a it's half in half out mm -hmm. Ah, uh, good point. The caves. It always comes back to the caves. And finally, uh Roswell, it's not a alien spacecraft. Do you think it's bullshit? I mean, I'm more apt to believe these days that it's uh it was some sort of government. That's what I craft. think, maybe. I yeah. think that's I think, I think that's something definitely crashed there, but sure. I don't know if it was extraterrestrial. I don't buy the nuts and bolts thing anymore, man. Like it's so hard. I think the more that's part of the deal with reading and, and actually being boots on the ground is you start to so you start to really rethink a lot of the traditional narratives of these types of stories. And I think, I think UFOs, uh, you know, uh, piloted by some intelligence are real, mm. but I don't necessarily think they're nuts and bolts. Well, that's a perfect segue into our next segment, which for you guys tonight. Now, typically we do a story of high strangeness where Bryce or I will bring a story like the Bell Witch or the Roswell and sort of present it for the guest. But when we have two people on, such as yourselves, uh, I gotta, we got to eschew us just telling you a story you've probably heard a million times <laughs> and talk to you about your own experiences. And Riley, are you gonna, or do you need to queue up for this one? Oh, we're ready, baby. High strangeness. <laughs> Let's talk about high strangeness, you guys. Um, we That's a term that we throw a lot, around a lot on our show. It's the name of a segment. its uh, I hear it more and more out there. When we actually started the show three years ago, it was sort of a kind of like underground phrase that like not a lot of people maybe necessarily knew about. Oh, but, hipsters. Um, mm -hmm. I hear it. All, we hear it all the time. I feel like we're hearing it more and more. So yeah. what does the term high strangeness mean to you guys? Go ahead. To me, it means more. Uh, I think it's just a more of an all encompassing phrase yeah. than just saying the paranormal. When you hear paranormal, I think most people think ghosts, you know? So I think a high strangeness to me is just anything that seems out of the ordinary. Yeah, I think that's a good way. It's sort of like a catch all really for for all of it, I think. And and it's sort of that space where you do find the crossover and there's so much of it. And, I, it, you know, we've talked about this a lot, but the idea that within the paranormal community, there's a lot of kind of compartmentalizing of interests and there isn't a lot of crossover. So a lot of Bigfoot people will not necessarily be interested in ghosts. And, um, but when you sit down, uh, with people that, you know, are more interested in other things, you do find that crossover. And I think it's that crossover where a lot of that high strangeness likes to hang out. And do you, so, uh, this nuts and bolts thing versus the, um, uh... I don't know. What is it? Psychic pro projection, something from another dimension. Mass, mass consciousness. Yeah, because you guys have been engaging with something on the other side, it feels like, in your investigation during Hellier. Um, I, 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 it's funny because I think it's hard for some of us to discount the idea that they're that these physical manifestations aren't something from our own reality. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. And how do you, oh, Bryce, I think we lost your sound there, buddy. Sorry, everybody. Stand by, because I know he's going to have something to say about this. Uh -oh. I know he does. They're silencing him. They're silencing you. Yeah, that's, he's too close to the truth. That's it. He was about <laughs> ready to reveal They're the They're shutting you down. Here, Bryce, I'll just fill in your, your words here. <laughs> 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 Maybe we kick him out and we bring him back in. Should we kick him yeah. out? Okay, oh, there we go. See, you just needed uh, the beep boops. It was just a simple mute <laughs> button. Oh, no, no, you muted yourself. There. <laughs> <laughs> no. 
I don't guys, know. I was having trouble with the cam and three years. Three years. Go and suck. Oh, oh. I mean, I was just going to say, you know, famed psychologist Carl Jung had no problem with uh, psychic manifestation taking on physical property. So I think those worlds can collide when it's like even something uh, is opaque as consciousness. It, it, it can, I think, uh, hold physical weight, for lack of a better term. So, I mean, maybe those things can somehow be connected. 100%. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I think... I think it just seems like the natural end goal to solving a lot of the problems that people have with different paranormal things is is the idea that somehow our consciousness is linked to this and we're again like I said earlier I think it needs us to interact with it it needs yeah. us to play with it in order for it to manifest and you you see that we're sort of the catalyst for a lot of these things that uh people are experiencing and I don't think that you can separate any of the physical experiences from the, the, the paranormal experiences. So is it something that is coming out of your brains, Greg and Dana, that's trying to manifest itself? Or is it like we've talked about maybe like the it, it requires the user to manifest? You know what I mean? Like if I see a UFO. Let's say let's let's go with this. And I see a glowing orb in the sky or a flying saucer and it's just me. Is that coming out of my subconscious and projecting itself into sort of a waking dream? Or was that a entity that's hanging around and it needed my brain waves to make contact? I don't see why it can't be. Both. I, I think it's both. Yeah, what? I think I think it can be. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I truly, it can be both. I mean, think about uh, you know, it, it wasn't it. It was Jung, <laughs> right, who even believed that UFOs were manifestations of an unhealthy mass consciousness. Yeah. And so I, th I think that that can be well. And think about what's huge right now. UFOs are huge again. Yeah. We're going through lots of turmoil. Yeah. Uh, I, I think that a lot of experiences. So let's use the Ouija board for example, right? Skeptics like to write it off and say it's the idiomotor effect. These can't be messages from anything. It's the idiomotor effect. Yes, I think so. When, when people say like, oh, it's all in your head, I think that's true. I just think that these things need us to communicate because we're the easiest tool for them to use, whether it's just tweaking that part of our brain that's the smell of a, a loved one that we lost, that maybe the intelligence still exists somewhere. They can make us mm. smell them to know that they're around. That smell's not really there. But we can smell it because we know the memory of it. So I think that there's an element of that happening with a lot of the paranormal experiences that people have. Is uh, their so brain what is you're the saying essentially is if you smelt it, you did dealt it. <laughs> you did, <laughs> no. <in fact>. what? <laughs> Something else dealt it. So yeah, right. Come on, keep up, Michael. Greg I and Dana. Saying, if it's coming from you, <laughs> you must be the one. Uh, I have a question. What is it like being full-time professional paranormalists? I mean, uh, is it all sex and UFO cults? Michael wrote that. <laughs> but uh, uh, what, I didn't what, say <laughs> cult. I just said, is it all sex and UFO? Oh, yeah, right, right, right. I had that. But what's it like? I mean, you know, there's not a lot of you guys uh, doing this full-time on the day-to-day. Uh, can you give us just a glimpse into what that's actually like? Oh, God. It's uh, <laughs> super depressing. Really, <laughs> really. Uh, we good. definitely live in a bit so of a... Acting. None of yeah. our family yeah. members are proud of us. <laughs> uh, we live in a bit of a vacuum and I think forget how actually weird we are until yeah. we, we say something in front of someone who's relatively normal and they look at you like, what did that person just say? <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, I thought that was normal. I, I think I, I think that's kind of fun, actually, to be perfectly honest yeah, with you. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a weird thing of like walking this line where yeah. you're you're trying to, to maintain some sense of normality when you're answering emails to people who are seeing goblins or uh, have UFOs abducting them. It's it's tough to go from that then go to uh, you know well politics right. You know right. what I mean? It's difficult. It's a good I think at least I think for us anyway. It's a it's a good uh, exercise in staying grounded and balanced because I think for us to be useful in this space, we do like Greg's all the time. He, he constantly talks about 
being on the fence and, and being kind of between and being in that space where we can recognize one side and recognize the other and not getting too, uh, pulled into one side or the other, because we sure. can't, we can't be good investigators if we're too far over here or too far over here. So it's a constant exercise of making sure that we're staying somewhere in the middle because it's very easy. I mean, you look at a lot of the older iconic investigators and then later in their lives, they do get kind of pulled into it and they, we, mm. we lose a lot of them to, uh, to what, you know, could be unhealth, really unhealthy ways of living. And so it's kind of, again, like I said, it's just sort of a constant, uh, staying balanced and it's gotta, gotta be yeah oh sorry go ahead no i was just gonna say on a, on a practical level it's a it's not an easy lifestyle because you know there's people that ask us this question like how do we do what you do how do we how do how can i be like a full-time weirdo well like you know <clears throat> no, hey, not a great you not, are. A, not a great <laughs> health are. plan <laughs> yeah right no you can't i mean it's it's we don't have kids we live a very minimal lifestyle we live in a you know two bedroom apartment that's mm -hmm. really cheap and we live uh, I mean so far you've just described my life as an actor <laughs> <laughs> yeah. but that's, that's a non-traditional yeah. non-traditional life successful actor in Hollywood you guys were, on, we're doing the same <laughs> fucking thing I'm feeling the same way about being a musician yeah. it's great but that's it right it's a non-traditional you, you make a lot of sacrifices to live a non-traditional lifestyle what is it that Gordon White says that you have to uh, about Ma true magic is is oh stored optionality. Stored optionality. Mm -hmm. You guys, I mean, you guys as musicians and as actors, you guys know all Creatives about stored optionality. In general, yeah. True magic is the ability to live so simply that you can do whatever you want when you want to. Oh, wow. that's amazing. That's magic. Yeah. Yeah. And you're 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 manifesting and and living in resonance with that idea that those types of experiences can come to you because you have that stored optionality because you can kind of go and do them and you can go whereas if someone who had kids or different types of responsibilities they can't just go i'm going to go shoot a pilot that could get picked up right now i'm going to drop everything and go and shoot it and it's not that's not a lifestyle for everyone and or i'm going to go on the road and play music for six months yeah you know what yeah. i mean uh so true magic is the ability to say yes. I love that. Whenever you I want. vowed after like selling that. 800 numbers that I was going to store lots of optionality. And uh, and so, yeah. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> I, I, I got to think it's got to be nice to have you two to keep yourselves in check because uh, I remember Grant Morrison, reading Grant Morrison talking about how you know, sure, you can call up gods, you can get into this stuff, <laughs> but like you still have to pay your bills at the end of the day. Yeah. And there's even moments in Hellier, which, you know, uh, there are times as, a, as, a, as, a, as someone who loves the show and who loves you guys, and I start to question, okay, are they just getting excited about like a couple numbers on a street address? Are they, sure. are they jumping too far in or is there something in this synchronicity as someone who buys mm -hmm. into that uh, myself? You know, so it's nice. It's always nice when I hear you guys go, all right, wait a minute. Maybe we're just freaking ourselves out mm -hmm. here. Yeah. I mean, the nice thing with Hellier specifically is there's a big enough group of us that if one person starts to, and we will all at certain points in time, and we have gotten a little too close to that side where you start feeling not necessarily excitable about everything, but, but that idea that you're kind of becoming less about one side or less about the middle and more one, the other, uh, there's enough of us that we'll pull each other back. And, and that's the nice thing is, you know, when somebody starts getting a little too weird about something or a little too obsessed with something, there's a handful of other people there that'll pull each other back. Well, what was, what was that moment for you guys each? Do, oh can you remember God. a moment where you're like, fuck dude, I need you to like, chill me out right now i mean my i do really well with all of the the paranormal stuff like the the magic and yeah. the, all that stuff I'm, I'm i'm fine with that i like living in that world and i think i can navigate it well but it's when we start getting into the the very scary human stuff yeah when it's it's like you know people talking about local murders and people talking about you know cults and things like that uh you know drug trafficking human trafficking and not I'm not like lizard people, baby brain drinking type stuff. But, but close, close. Yeah. But close. You know, the, the stuff that all of that's based on. Mm -hmm. The real stuff. The real the real stuff. Um yeah. corruption. That stuff um freaks me out. And then just 
unhinged like like people who are a little off kilter because people are always way scarier to me than any monster ever uh because you you don't i mean i don't know too many people who've been hurt by a ghost like really hurt right people on the other hand mm-hmm. that's a whole other story so so when when we got to that stuff and even still i mean there's a lot of real weirdos when it comes to hellier who i mean we've had people drive by our house real slow mm-hmm. we've had people like find our phone numbers and call us at I all mean, hours we've of had the night. death threats death threats wow stalkers. which is super weird it's a show about goblins yeah Seriously. And we've gotten like death threats from it, like people literally threatening to kidnap us. Mm-hmm. Well, That's I mean, it, it is a thing too where you're sort of like, mm. I think as the shows progress, sort of putting on for, you know, for me, it's sort of a very strong, especially season two, strong example of sort of like, even though it seems to be that maybe you guys are being, being pulled into some ritual, like, I feel like you guys are practicing some real practical, for lack of a better term, practical magic in this where you're like okay we're we have we have intention we have will we're trying to bring about a result but then you're gonna get these Mm, hangers on that want to come in and play a part in the narrative that they think they're playing um and that is scary that yeah totally and those were the Mm -hmm. scary parts of it it's that i i loved the um the folklorist that you had open the phenomena phenomena uh Phenomena Con today. Uh, what was Phenomena Con was taken, so we had to add an extra syllable oh. in there. <laughs> what was the, what was the uh, who who was the woman who uh, was Doctor Doctor Kita? Andrew she was Kita. amazing, yeah. and awesome. I love the idea that like we're sort of almost reliving this moment of the 1980s satanic panic right yeah. now, yes. where everyone's scared about occultists and like kids being. In well, it's danger. you guys, the, the Hollywood elite. You guys are out there drinking right, baby right, brains. Right, exactly. That's true. That's what we do. I don't know. <laughs> when we're not by... Oh, Bright, uh, Riley. Oh. Fresh and Um. So as a team, you guys have like promoted or encouraged unconventional methods in your investigations, like using hypnosis to induce an, an alien abduction in the second season of Hellier oh, or yeah. that state. Um. What's the thought process between behind your non-traditional approach to investigating the phenomenon? The map is not the territory. Yeah. Mm. The map only shows you the edge of however far you can get. Mm-hmm. You you can't go any further if you're just following the map. So you have to try new stuff. Yeah, it's it's sort of this visual of of mm. being you you can either hike the path that's been hiked a million times or you can carve your own way through. And I think you know, the fun part about that is if you're a person who's okay with failing, sometimes it doesn't work. And sometimes it's just completely a waste of time. But at least you've tried it. And again, it's that idea of, I think really, uh, one of the things that we're always thinking about is just how do we how can we approach this creatively? Like, what can we, what could potentially open up a new pathway for us? So we're just sort of throwing it all at the process and seeing what fits and sometimes it doesn't some i mean obviously we document a lot of our our dead ends and and sometimes stuff will work and sometimes it won't uh but i think it's that idea again of like play you want to play and introducing fun creative ways of maybe approaching some of this stuff it 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 gives you that feeling of kind of engaging and and you i do find that we fall into the current a lot more when we do stuff like that it's a cool way of getting results. I love that you guys sort of are the clarion call for like, hey, Bigfoot enthusiasts, ghost people, let's work together to figure out what the hell this shit is. A hundred percent. I think if we started to do that, we'd realize that there's so much more in common between all of these fields. And I mean, I've said it a million times, but it, I think it's just human nature that everybody who believes something that might be seen as weird wants someone who's a little weirder than them. So, uh, yeah, I mean, hey, I believe in a big hairy monster in the forest, but at least I'm not that guy getting probed in the butt by aliens, <laughs> you know, <laughs> that type of thing. You know, so speaking I, hey, of the big hairy monster. That's fun for some of us. I'm <clears> hey, <throat> you know. <laughs> um, you know, when we were first talking about uh, names for the show of this podcast, we uh, one of the first names we liked was Bigfoot is a ghost. But Greg, you're really the first one to ever sort of posit that idea that that Bigfoot might be a ghost. What what led you to that? And are you still there today? I don't I don't think I am the first person to posit that. I I, okay. I think I'm I think there's a lot of people who have had that idea. 
I think what I, one of the things I think I'm good at is just taking ideas that are very hard to boil down and just be like, well, Bigfoot is a topic thought form. Mm-hmm. What's your elevator pitch? Of whatever. That? It's like, no, the elevator pitch is Bigfoot's a ghost. Yeah. Right. right? right. <laughs> because that one gets it right into somebody's head real fast. So I think people have known this for a long time. I mean, I see you're, you're reading um, Where the Footprints End. Oh, it's incredible. I mean, his idea that, you know, uh, poltergeist, we think about poltergeist and that's something we think of indoors and, and usually around people, whereas the Bigfoot is almost like an outdoors poltergeist, something mm-hmm. he quoted as a wilderness geist. And I just, Absolutely. I love that idea. And it's like, it it's hard to go back to, just like the nuts and bolts, it's hard to go back to Bigfoot is just an unconfirmed North American wood ape, a flesh and blood creature. (laughs) It's like I can't get there again. You know, it's once that door's closed, it's hard to go back in it, you know? And I don't know if you guys, uh, Greg and Dana, if you guys have seen Expedition Bigfoot, but I actually think that it follows in the steps of Hellier in a few ways, which is, you know, you guys go out there, Bryce, uh, uh, with one expectation, and then the woods goes, no, fuck you. This is what we're going <laughs> to yeah. do. Well, and and you have guys, um, not, not Ronnie. Ronnie's a little bit open-minded, but but the uh, I'm sorry, what's the other uh, dude's name? Um, uh, Russell. Russell seeing yeah. orbs, and, you know, and the whole thing ends up leading to a cave at the end well, of the day. Even Maria hearing children's laughter in the night. You know, and speaking of this, no, not a lot of people know this, but when we were first developing that show, I sent uh, the creatives Hellier, and I was like, watch this. Dude. This is... And they were like, oh, okay, we're lighting this all different now. <laughs> I, 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 I had talks. I, I talked to one of your showrunners because Amazing. one of your showrunners is really good friends with a friend of mine. Oh, that's wild. Uh, and so, like, there's there's overlap everywhere. That's wild. Uh, it's crazy. Yeah. I was you guys, like, yeah. I was just might- like, this is the best paranormal television I've ever seen. If we can even, like. Oh, just emulate on. this, you know. <laughs> <laughs> you guys might be behind bringing this all together in some uh, some More melting chaos. pot, chaos um, magic. Yeah, exactly. Uh, okay, so uh, last question for you guys in the high strangeness, and then we got one last segment before we wrap up. I know you guys are very tired, uh, but um, on Bigfoot Collectors Club, uh, we collect stories and experiences, but you guys actually collect haunted artifacts. And I'm very curious to know what are each of your favorite collector's items in the collection? Oh. Is there well, one thing they're so like, hard. I could I could get rid of all this, but this needs to stay. I mean, we have I don't know. The trouble is we we it's like the way that we view a lot of it is when when we get something that we truly do think there's something stranger to we don't really see ourselves as collecting it so much as caring for it. Yeah. And so there's a lot of things that we have that have their own weird quirks. It's strange to say, but some of them don't get along. They have to be stored separately. Some <laughs> of them don't seem to like uh, one of us or, or each of us. And some of them, like, there's one we had to take back. Yeah. We had to take it back to a cave in the Catskill Mountains. We did that <laughs> two years ago. Uh, because the people who sent it to us... Uh, I think I saw... Did you guys make a video of this? Did you so make we, it? we we we've been working on a documentary with Carlos, the like a follow up to between like Hellier stuff, which eventually will be out. We're supposed to go shoot some more of it, but it's we called it the Crone, and mm-hmm. it's this little item that has uh, nails in the eyes mm-hmm. and a noose around its neck. And um, that one, I think that one's think no offense, Billy, but that one I think is my favorite, just because <laughs> it I'll is. Talk about Billy. It is a really great indication of the type of work that we're always trying to do. Because one of the things we did is we grabbed Tyler, who saw in um, Hellier, because he's a special effects makeup artist. And so he was able to figure out how to actually make a mold of this thing so we could still have something in the collection to talk about the story wow. and yet return it. Mm-hmm. So we spent... <laughs> return it to the woods, not we, not the people. No, not right. the people. <laughs> we, right, right. we spent a day, we had to hike miles, like eight miles up into the mountains. Um, we oh, we took a heater that wasn't even for us. It was for the mold to the set mold up. Had to set, Dana yeah. set a big circle and we did this ritual with like a hundred witches from around the world wow. at the same time in unison. Pulled the nails out pulled the noose off, crazy shit going on all around us, like trying wow. to get us to stop. I mean, people were getting like 
They were getting choked around this thing. There were car accidents happening. Oh my the God, craziest yeah. thing I saw was watching uh, a conference. We were in a big conference room. This was actually the last time that we brought, if you're talking about the oh, same, yeah. the last time that we brought this object out into the general public. That after this experience, we were like, we can never bring this out again. That was what made us realize we have to take this thing yeah, back. We can't, we can't in good conscience hang on to this thing. Um, we were... At this point now, we were already weird and dicey about it. We'd yeah. seen weird things in our house, found wet footprints in our house. We, like, we television had, almost dropped on my head. Yeah, we had it in a Crazy. box, and we just wouldn't open the box. So if it came to that event, usually it would never come out of the box. Um, so we went to this event, <laughs> and we always <laughs> feel it out. I was like, this is too much, man. <laughs> <laughs> we always would feel the event out, because there's some events we'd go to where, like, the crowd just wasn't right. Like... You know the type. Dude bros yelling at ghosts. That's not the type of people we want this thing around. Mm -hmm. We were feeling a little funky about it. We weren't going to bring her out. And then somebody had driven like eight hours or something to come see our display. And they were specifically interested in the crone. And it it was when a lecture was happening. So it was very quiet in the room. So we sort of, I think I could see Greg kind of weighing up the pros and cons. And he was like, fine. You know, there was, there wasn't that many people in the room at the time. So it should be okay. Unlock the box, pull her out of the box, um, still in the pillowcase she was sent in, and just sort of like held her there. And it, it almost immediately after that happened, uh, this weird, for lack of a better word, force just shot down the conference hall. <laughs> a sonic boom. Like it just went. Wow. The lights started swinging. Um, the, the person in, <laughs> I won't say their name, but they were across from us. Fairly big personality. Shakira, it's fine. We Shakira, can we, we all know. <laughs> her bottles, her bottles of soda popped, exploded, and wow, sprayed all over her books and destroyed this, all of her merch. This is something screaming. out of Indiana Jones. It was unreal. it was insane. I've never seen anything like this. She, she starts screaming and growling like an animal. It was oh really weird. God. And then, like, you could just sort of see the ripple go all the way down the conference hall. Yeah, like, the lights were swinging down that People were, like, looking around to see what was going on. And then this dude, halfway down the hall, rolls his head back. His eyes roll back in his head. And he just starts bleeding out of his mouth. And has no. Come on. I swear. There's there's witnesses to all of this. He had a, and he just had a seizure. Instantly had a seizure. Had a seizure. And it was, like, right when the box was open. And the guy... Who oh. asked us to open the box? Started crying and said, "I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. Yeah. Put it back. You were right. Put it back. Put it back." And that was the day we said we got to get rid of this thing. Yeah, wow. So that's that's my favorite, just because we were able to take it back, stop what was happening, and still have a representation of this thing that's one one museum quality to show uh, for all of the effort. Fuck. Any any, any weird. Activity from the carbon copy? No. No. Nope. We still have the nails and the noose, but those are locked up. Those are the only things we have. And I wouldn't be surprised if there'd be some weird stuff around them if we did some things with them. Wow. I hope that answered your question, Michael. (laughs) Damn. uh, That (laughs) answered half of my question, unfortunately. (laughs) Uh, Dana, anything to add? I mean, I think I, I could probably go on the other side of the spectrum. Uh, we we have an object in the museum that sort of internally we refer to as Billy. And mm. Billy is a... I know a, who Billy is. Yeah, yeah I did too. Great. Billy is a, a Kisi figure from the central Congo. And when we first uh, were given Billy, we had a lot of very scary activity around, you know, around him and, and a lot of scary EVPs. And people had, ha- you know, they experienced a lot of kind of frightening things. And it... Billy's kind of a really beautiful example of uh, the way that we approach a lot of the objects that we're given. And really, the, at the end of the day, what we're always trying to figure out is why is there why is this object active? And at the end of the day, if we can discover that there's some kind of an intelligence attached to it and, and that is capable of communication or just an intelligence in general, we have some kind of a responsibility at that point to find some resolution for this because we're talking about something that's an intelligent energy or or an intelligent entity. And so Billy is a really great example of that, where in the beginning, initially people were having scary experiences and it was a a mixture between, obviously this was over the course of a few years, but uh, real 
actual research and working with people that are much smarter than we are, archaeologists and, and, you know, people that could actually kind of lead us to the final conclusion and discovering what Billy actually was, which is this really beautiful uh, uh, idol that would have been used in the Congo for spirit communication, uh, to communicate with the gods, to communicate with the land. And so Billy was this very fascinating in between and what we were experiencing initially with him was sort of uh him getting used to us too and so it was a process and and it's such a great example i think because so often in the paranormal specifically the ghost hunting world the word demon gets thrown around a lot and if one thing that is that we as living people kind of perceive as being negative or scary like scratches or hair pulling uh you know most of the time people will kind of jump instantly on the it's evil or it's a demon kind of train. And, and it was a great example of pushing through that fear and really relying on actual research to guide you towards the actual conclusion, which was this object wasn't evil or anything, anything like that. It was, it was that we needed to understand what, what Billy was. And so, you know, that again happened over the course of many, many years. And he's just sort of this really wonderful, uh, beautiful example of, what can happen when you research things the right way and not, and not instantly go like demons. Right. I love that. Cause it's beautiful. Mm-hmm. Um, and I have to ask before we move on, uh, November's coming up La- past couple years. That was around the time when I would get a free show on my laptop called Hellier. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> any 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 tease anything i'm sure you get this all the time is, <laughs> do, do i have a hellier three to look forward to this year i i hate to be the bearer of bad news but um carl refuses to do a uh zoom season of hellier <laughs> so <laughs> <laughs> that that makes sense that that cracks. Mm-hmm. photographers what, but what that, doesn't, do? that, that, that doesn't rule it out forever yeah. no i i think i think uh at this point, I don't think it's a secret. This stuff isn't stopping. In mm-hmm. fact, it's just growing. And I think, you know, I think part of that ego death is realizing that that story is bigger than us, mm-hmm. and realizing that it's 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 tipped some dominoes. And sure. so uh, we'll there, we will return to it yeah. at, at some okay. point. Great, great. I love Hopefully, it. sooner than later. Great. All right. I know it's late. Do you guys have a, a time to play a quick p- party game with us? Dude, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm in, like tonight. I said. All right, good. Let's All do right. it. All right, cool. I can't, I can't read, uh, com- you know, I don't see comments. I don't know if people are ready to go to bed, but we got a party game to wrap it up. There's 270 people still. <laughs> Fantastic. Been, oh, wow. Okay. That, All right. That's four times our audience. So <laughs> let me get, let me Not anymore. <laughs> Not anymore. There you go. All right. All right. So, Bryce, what do you got for us? All right, hold on. See if I have any mezcal left. I've been I've been keeping half an eye on the comments, and I got to say, your guys' audience is hilarious and cool, okay. and uh, we They're love you guys. Yeah. Oh right, uh, oh. Riley, we got a we got a plaque for this one. We got oh, a slide yeah. for this one. Let's hit it. <laughs> Time for the conspiracy game, <laughs> guys. It's Team Bigfoot, Michael and Riley versus Team Goblin, and we are going to play the conspiracy game. This is from the conspiracy game from our friends at Netty Games. Now, I have five categories here. Aliens, schemes, tech, mythos, and random. You guys will get to pick a category. I'll ask you a question. And if your team gets it right, you get one point. If your team gets the question wrong, the other team gets a chance to answer. Once a category has been correctly answered, it's no longer available. The first team to five points wins. We'll start with you, Greg and Dana. Team Goblin. Ooh. Team Goblin. Okay. Would you like me to repeat the categories? Yes, or did one please. stick out? Yeah, okay, me, your me, categories me are aliens, okay. schemes, tech, mythos, or random. I'll let you pick. Let's do mythos. All right. Mythos. Ooh. Here we go. Greg and Dana. In 2020, New Zealand cave explorers claimed that a Reiki or a shield forced them to abandon their search for what artifact? Is it A? Pieces of an alien spaceship? Is it B, a Stargate? C, the tomb of the ancient one? Or D, skeletons of giant humanoids? Oh my God. God. You can talk out loud. It's okay. Can we? Work it out out loud. <laughs> I, uh... You don't have to telepathically communicate. So here's the thing. 
I don't know the answer to this one <laughs> at all. Okay. But I want to rule. I want to rule some stuff out. I don't think it's aliens. Okay. Yeah. I don't think that it's what was the what was the other one? B is Stargate. I don't think it's C a Stargate. Is Tomb of the Ancient One or D is skeletons of giant humanoids. I don't know why. I, I want to say it's skeletons of giant humanoids. Okay, I'm gonna go with you on that. But, but why are you being pulled the other direction? For some reason, I feel like Stargate is popping out of my head. Really? I mean, I That's because you're into Atlantis and shit like I, that. Maybe. <laughs> Listen, if I'm if I'm gonna go with you, but if I'm right, I'm gonna laugh in your face. Okay. As usual. This is our typical relationship <laughs> dynamic. I'm going to choose the wrong answer and then be you know what? for it. Dana, you did the right thing. Greg, you're right. It's oh, good. The skeletons right. of giant humanoids. I was going to fight for Stargate. I'm so pissed. <laughs> I would have been. Dana, if you and I were on the same team, we would have just lost this. I know. Now, Riley, now Michael, your, if they get, if they get one right. I, I was going skeletons. I was skeletons. That. <laughs> yeah. It felt Anunnaki, right. Man. It felt right. On. Now, Michael, if they get one right, do they get to go again, or shall I move no, on? No, no, now it comes to us. Now it okay, comes Team to Bigfoot, us. choose okay. a category. Mike, uh, you... I want to do aliens, of course. Yeah, good choice. Let's do it. Let's get right into it. <laughs> Boy, by the Riley way. Riley and Michael, terrible. what alien species takes a human host by injecting a parasite into a victim's eye? Is it A, Ocularis? Is it B, Vril? C, the Greys? D, Elohims? Okay, I, I know like, it's not Vril. Vril. I feel like A is too obvious because, like, ocular, like, but maybe. I, one could argue that the, the Greys do it by injecting eye. operations in the eye. And then the last one was which? The last one was Elohims. The Elohims, Elohim. that's like a biblical, biblical thing. Yeah. I think it's A or C. Uh, ocularis is too, it's too perfect <laughs> yeah. to be right. Should it's we like say the Greys? Up. Let's say the grays. Oh God, they inject stuff in your eyes. We all saw fire in the sky. No, that the <laughs> the vril. The vril is like a Nazi super energy. I don't think it's the vril. I. We got to pick one. I know. Come on. We have to finish the show go. at some you point. You go, Riley. You were right about the last <laughs> question. You pick it. I trust you. I want to say. D, but I feel like we're gonna lose this game. I'm gonna stop both of you. You're both wrong. It's Vril. Michael, it's Vril. <laughs> Michael. Uh, well, wait. Is I, it really? I wouldn't have guessed that. No. Right. right. Yeah. So you're not playing what? the game right. Because if we get it wrong, they have a chance to answer. Oh, right. Well, the yeah, answer is yeah. Vril. <laughs> yeah. I knew that. Right. For two no Goblin. Point. I knew right. that. Point. <laughs> you're gonna give it to Goblin? No. I would have gone with A, frankly. I'm, I'm right. with Riley. I, yeah, Let's pick another A. category. <laughs> Aliens great. is still on You're the board. Good. Now expect it, it's one to yeah, zero. Aliens is still on the board. We have right. alien schemes, tech, or random. I'm feeling spicy. Let's do random. Let's do. I was gonna say random. Here we go. Let's just go. Random for it. it is. Dana and Greg, who do conspiracists claim is responsible for the 1961 death of Michael Rockefeller, son of New York Governor Nelson Rockefeller? Is it A. Russian diplomat Ivan Lebe Lebedev? Is it B. His father, C, the FBI, or D, a tribe of cannibals. Nineteen sixty-one, oh, death of Michael Rockefeller. Too. I'm now worried this is going to go for two no, hours. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I, I want to say A. Uh, That's what I want to say. You want to say A? Yeah, it's the Russians. It's always okay. the Russians, right. right? Yeah. Wrong. It's a tribe of cannibals. No, you know right. what? Oh, right, right. You're not supposed to right, tell it. Right, right, right. All right, all right, all right. All right. All right. <laughs> We get a chance to answer. Just say wrong. Bright, Bryce is question. the worst man in black <laughs> ever. Listen, you don't. You guys don't even understand. I don't play by the rules. He's Michael. like, you're wrong yeah. about the secret. The secret is actually this. I don't play by the rules. You guys stay away understand. from this because this I is went, what it is. I went I over this happened. with him before the show, and he, I knew he wasn't listening. Man, what he gets that hat? And he was like, I got it. Yeah. All right, as soon as go. he dresses as a man in black. All right. All right. Michael Bryce, Riley. Aliens. <laughs> Aliens, Scheme, aliens, tech, aliens, 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 always aliens, 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 <laughs> aliens, aliens, here we go. God, the worst person to play a game with, and he <laughs> just invented one called Dirty Picture Cover-Up. It's a good game. Yeah, go sign Great up, game. the dpcugame.com. Here we go. Go play what with is the name? <laughs> what is the name given to the alien-human hybrids that look like giant walking insects? Is it A, Humex, B, Mantids, C, Prawns, or D, Zindi? Mantids, I mean, mantids, B, mantids, yeah, B, mantids, B, mantids. And if we get it wrong, yeah. 
Don't tell us what the correct answer is. <laughs> well, you didn't get it wrong because it's Mantids. Yes. <laughs> one right. to one. Three categories yeah. left. All right. All right. Here we go. <laughs> Aliens is off the table. Greg and Dana, schemes, tech, or random? Uh, well, you pick this one. Let's go with schemes. All right. Schemes. Of course here we you go. choose that. Schemes. All right. What U.S. military program used a team of psychics to gather intelligence by doing remote viewing? Is it A, Stargate, B, Stranger Things, C, Montauk, or D, Third Eye? A, come on. Bingo, nice. Stargate. It was Stargate this time. There we go. Stranger two to one. Things. Two to one. If we, if we, okay, we got, we got two chances to get back and win this. Yeah. <laughs> Riley Michael, only things left is tech and random. Tech? Yeah, tech. I'm feeling yeah. tech. Tech me. Here we go. In the late 1890s, hundreds of people across the Western United States reported seeing what object in the skies overhead? Is it A, a glowing vortex of blue light? B, a group of small disc-shaped crafts? C, a single massive airship? D, a strobing light coming from the moon? Okay, the year again? Is 1890s. It's airship the airship. Flat. It's yeah, airship. 100%. Final answer? Yes. Final. Correct. Yeah. All right, tie All game. Right. This is for the win. If you, oh, boy. For the win. Team Goblin, if you get this, you win. If we yep. get it, if you get it wrong and we get it, we win. Yeah. Mm. Break and Dana, the for the win. Team match. Goblin, call them Team Goblin. We went over team, the rules. Team <laughs> Goblin for the win. <laughs> for the win. <laughs> team the win. Goblin. You know what's funny? I had, a, I had a discussion like three years ago when we were trying. We actually tried to get Hellier on TV, and it wasn't. It was just wasn't happening because they what, they asked us to change everything. And they were like, well, what we want is we want you guys to go to different caves every week and look for <laughs> goblins. <laughs> I mean, and I went, I don't want to be the goblin guy. And the guy was like, I got bad news for you, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> you guys it. are the goblin guy. We're the goblin guys now. Done. The goblin oh, guy. That's so that's so network. A different cave every week. <laughs> yeah. Different what underground monsters. What about what about Hawaiian goblins? Yeah, there's gotta be some. Yeah, the the Menahune. For sure. <laughs> <laughs> Lava caves? Team Goblin for the win. Project A. 119 planned on testing a nuclear weapon where? Is it A, in the hollow earth, B, in a salt mine outside of Chicago, D, on Antarctica, or D, C, on yeah, Antarctica, okay. or Buddy, D, You're drinking the non-alcoholic beer here. On the moon. It's the moon, baby. Moon. It's the moon. Final answer? Final answer. Yeah. Team Goblin for the win! Ah, uh, yeah. Congratulations. Yeah. Nuke the moon. Very it was very close. About that. <laughs> it was very I mean, close. Thank God the well-researched, well-versed paranormal investigators won this over the <laughs> yeah, right. out-of-work actor podcasters. I mean, yeah, yeah. Uh, we, yeah. yeah. You guys well earned played. that win. Congratulations. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We thank you. Who knows how it would have turned out if Bryce had followed the rules for the first couple? <laughs> <laughs> follow the rules. There's no if you rules. learn anything here today, it's never follow the rules. <laughs> oh, boy. All right. Be a well, rule breaker. I want to thank everyone attending Phenomenonicon who joined us tonight. We want listeners just like you to make <laughs> Bigfoot Collectors Club even better. So please listen and su uh, subscribe to us on BCC uh, on your favorite podcast app or and or listen to, and buy merch at Campfire Media's website. We are campfire.media. There's new episodes that drop every Wednesday. Uh, you can stay up to date with everything we do by following us on Instagram at Bigfoot Collectors Club and Twitter at Bigfoot Pod. And if you'd like a deeper dive and support the show, you can join us on our Patreon, BCC The Other Side, at patreon.com slash Bigfoot Collectors Club. Um, Greg and Dana, wow. huge thank you to you guys. Where uh, we don't know where Bigfoot can be found. Where can people find you who are listening to this at home? Uh, if they if they want more information about us, they can always go to hellier.tv or they can go to weirdhq.com. If they're curious about the work we do at the museum, they can go to paramuseum.com. That's probably it. Nailed it. Awesome. Fantastic. Uh, thank you and everyone at the conference for hosting us. Until next year. 
Mm-hmm. <laughs> of course. Oh my god. <laughs> you know we do these. We do these every six months. Yeah, we'll oh. just come back in yeah. six well, months. That's next year. Uh, good night. And go get regressed. Oh. Thank you guys. Thank, Thank, you. Thank you guys. Ooh, that was what an so honor. fun. And no, thanks man. Thank you, you so much. This was uh, this too. was yeah. so fun, and uh, uh, I seriously thank you guys for coming and doing this as as the after hours thing. I, I was trying to think of fun stuff to do that were, um, was kind of like relaxed, and you guys were one of the first things that popped up. So I'm glad uh, you guys love made it. the time. We'll come back right. anytime on the show. We'd love to have oh you. Oh my gosh, anytime. Uh, and, and then you know, once we're out of this whole pandemic bullshit. <sighs> Let's go on a fucking investigation. Yay! Yeah, dude, let's do it. Done. All right. Be amazing. Done. Let's I'm absolutely still, do it. We got thank it. You guys. All right. Thank you guys. We love you. And thank you Have to everyone who's listening. Thank Everybody, you. Everybody's loving go it. Go subscribe to their yes. Patreon. There are people oh. in the, on the way. There I've were people in the comments joined. talking about it. So go free do it. Show, free show on the main feed. And then you can support us on the Patreon. You'll get three to five bonus episodes every month. But, you know, you can find us wherever you find your favorite Yay. podcast. Thank you guys. Bye. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Hey, guys. Yay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>